John 15. So I was thinking tonight, what, you know, it was kind of like a, a bit of a last minute decision as to what I was going to preach on. I normally have a plan of what I'm going to preach on, usually a couple of weeks. I wasn't really sure till this week of what I wanted to cover. And I've, I thought about what I've been preaching on. I've preached a lot of doctrine. I've preached a lot of information, you know, why we're a Baptist church, fundamental church, things like that. I felt like I hadn't really preached much practical sermons for a little while. So I thought, no, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on something practical, especially in light of, you know, Christmas coming up. You know, we've got, what is it, three weeks till Christmas, roughly? Um, so, you know, Christmas is a time where, you know, you sort of turn your attention to your loved ones, don't you? You turn your attention to your friends and your family. You know, people generally think, you know, well, let's, you know, let's go to someone's house for Christmas. Let's have people over for Christmas. You know, people start thinking about gifts, you know, who do I need to buy gifts for this year and, and so on and so forth. Generally, that's what happens. And look, some people get carried away with Christmas, you know, but there's nothing evil in of itself, all right? There's nothing wrong with rem remembering the Lord's birth. There's nothing wrong with giving gifts. There's nothing evil about the day in of itself. The Lord's created the day, right? So there's nothing wrong with, with you know, having times, a time where you, you know, fellowship with one another, with your friends and with your family. And so what I wanted to talk about today is, the title of this message is Be a Friend. Be a Friend. Okay, so I want to preach about friendship today. Okay, and in particular, look at John 15, verse 12. Let's read it again. Just this passage here from verse 12. Jesus says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another. Okay, he's talking to his disciples, he's talking to his believers, and he's telling his believers, This is my commandment, that ye love one another. He wants us as disciples to love one another. And he says, As I have loved you. So the same love that Jesus Christ has for us, he wants us to share that same love toward our brothers in Christ, right? Toward our loved ones. Verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, I'm not sure if the disciples realized at this point what Jesus was talking about, you know, that Jesus Christ himself would lay down his life. But what does he call us? What does he call his disciples? His friends. You know, it's an amazing thing that the God of the universe thinks of the believers as his friends. Can you say, I'm a friend of God? That, we should be able to boldly say that, right? Jesus Christ laid down his life for his friends. He died on the cross for our sins, so we can be right with God. Then verse 14, what did he say? What did he say? He says, ye are my friends. Jesus Christ, disciples, you are my friends. Ye are my friends. But there's a condition, right? If ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. So Jesus says, hey, you know, we, we talk a lot about serving God, we talk about serving Jesus Christ, and there's nothing wrong with that. We are servants of the Most High, we are servants of our Lord God Almighty, but Jesus Christ doesn't want us to just think of ourselves as servants, you know, where you might go to work and you don't know what the manager's thinking, you don't know what the manager's planning, you don't know what, you know, the long-term goals are, you, you know, you know what your day-to-day your -day job is, but you don't know necessarily what the long-term plans of the business is, you know, that might be discussed amongst management and not really passed on to the employees until the time is right. Jesus says, no, 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 I don't want you, that's not how it works in my kingdom. That's not how it works with my friends. Okay, you're more than servants, you're my friends, and I want you to know everything. I want you to know the plan of God. I want you to know the, all the scriptures. You know, later on he talks about the Holy Ghost coming and testifying of Christ and all these things. We won't go there. But you are a friend of Jesus Christ, right? You are a friend. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your friend, and he wants you to be a friend back to him, okay? And then verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and whatsoever you shall ask my, in the, uh, of my Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another, okay? So it's a very simple commandment, love one another, okay? I'm your friend, be a friend to others, right? Now, Jesus tells us, basically from this passage, immediately, immediately we, we know what a friendship is. Okay? A friendship is not a one-way relationship. It's a two-way thing. Re friendships are a two-way street. It's give and take. Right? Jesus says, I give my life to you. Because okay? you're my friends. Right? And then he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. So there's a bit of give and take there, right? Jesus says, hey, I'm going to be friendly to you. I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to lay down my life on the cross for your sake. 
And then you can be a friend back to me if you do the things that I ask you to do, if you do the commands that I've left you with, in particular this command of loving one another. Okay? And the command of bearing much fruit, right? Getting souls saved. You know, bringing people into the kingdom. These are two main things that we ought to be doing, right? Getting people saved, but also loving the brethren the same way that Jesus Christ loves you. But first thing I just want you to realize about a friendship, it's a two-way relationship. Okay? If one person is trying to be friendly to one, but the other person shows no, is not receptive to that, that friendship's not going to last. Okay? If you're, if you're just about yourself, you know, just to who you consider your friend, and you have no interest in the other person, that friendship's not going to last. Jesus recognizes that there's a two-way street. I give, and you give. You do the commandments. If ye are my friends, so ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you, right? Now, I'm always interested in the etymology of a word. If you don't know what that means, it's just looking at the root. Because English has been influenced by many languages, by Latin, by uh, uh, German, and um, even French has influence in the English language. And I often like to go back and look at the etymology of the word, where it's come from. So I had a look at the word friend. And it comes back from a German Germanic background. But even further than that, um, this Indo-European uh, word. And you know what it meant? It meant someone to love. That's what friend meant. Someone to love. Okay, so when you think of a friend, that is, I, that is what a friend is, right? Someone that I love. Someone that I care about. Someone that I cherish. Someone that I appreciate. Okay, that can be your wife. That can be your children. That can be your family and relatives. But it also can be people in church. It can be people outside of church. People that you know, that you're acquainted with. It's someone that you love. Someone that you care about, right? So uh, we often tell the kids, you know, hey, we want you to be friends. We don't want you just to be brother and sister. We actually want you guys to be friends, right? So the company, some people think you can't be friends with brother and sister. You know, friends are outside of that. No, brothers and sisters, brothers, you know, you guys can be friends as well, you know, because quite often siblings like to fight. And, you know, that, obviously that's not friendly. So we, we teach them to be friends and we teach them to be friends to one another because it's someone they love. That's what friend means. And so it seems perfectly good sense that Christ says that you're my friends, but love one another, right? Because those two things go together. You know, James 2.23 says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Right? Why was he called the friend of God? Because he believed God. <laughs> he just put his faith on God. He believed what God was saying. And that's what imputed righteousness upon Abraham. And because of that, he's called the friend of God. I mean, it's not difficult to be a friend of God. Just believe what he says. And then do it, right? <laughs> do what he says. Um, now, what are some reasons that people avoid making friends? Some people don't like making friends. Some people avoid, you know, avoid making friends. Why? why? I'll give you some reasons for that. Number one, there's a fear of rejection. Okay? There's a fear of rejection. If I try to open myself up, if I try to be friendly to them, then that person might spit in my face. That person might reject me. Okay, that, that's one reason. There's a fear of rejection. Maybe they've been rejected in the past, they've been hurt in the past, and so they build up this wall, you know, this protective wall, and go, no, I'm not going to be friends because I'm, I'm, he's going to hurt me. You know? That's one reason why people don't avoid, make, uh, avoid making friends. A second reason is that they have a poor self-image about themselves. You know, they think, well, nobody's interested in me. You know, I mean, that's not because, that's just what they think. They think, I'm not an interesting person. Why would anyone be interested in me? You know, I don't want to put myself out there again. It's the same kind of idea, just, just uh, by the way, there's a lot of self-centeredness in this, by the way. Okay? There's a lot of self centeredness Looking at themselves, that fear of making friends. You know, no one's interested in me. You know, the third reason is shyness. You know, some people are very shy. And, and what it means to be shy is that there's a fear of others. They don't like to be in, in a group of other people because they have a fear of other people. They have a fear of making friends, right? Shy, you know, a lot of people think being shy is a positive thing. It's actually not. Again, it's, it's a very self-centered thing. Hey, I'm, I'm scared of other people. Okay, I'm scared of making friends. And a lot of people sometimes confuse shyness with humility, right? Because when you're, when you're humble, when you, when you show humility, what are you doing? You're kind of taking, you're taking a step back you know, you're, eating, you're, you're taking down your pride, you're taking down your ego, and you're saying, hey, I'm going to put others before me. I'm going to hold them higher than I hold myself. I'm going to esteem other better than I esteem myself. That's humility, right? But that, that's being outward focused. That's looking at other people and saying, hey, I'm going to humble myself so I can get along with them. 
right? So I can be a blessing to them and not think of, of myself as high and mighty. But shyness is different. Being shy is fearing others because I'm afraid of what others think of me, okay? I'm afraid of what others think of me. Again, it's very self-centered. It's very self-focused, okay? Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, I'll just read it to you. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Okay? So being shy, being afraid of other people is not something God wants us to have. He doesn't want us to feel that way. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but then look at this, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So your shyness, your fear of others is going to stop you from loving other people, okay? Because the spirit of fear is not the same spirit as the one of, a, of power, of a sound mind, and of love. And if we're commanded to love one another, we need to try to get over that self-centeredness and put our focus on other people, okay? A fourth reason why people avoid making friends is just selfishness, okay? Being selfish. What I mean by that is they look at someone and say, and say look, there's, there's nothing that I can get from that person, there's no benefit of me making friends with that person. That's very selfish, right? That's very selfish. Because you're saying, I can't get anything positive out of that person, so I'm not going to impart anything to that person. But remember, friendships take give and take, right? So if there's someone that you think, you know, I can't get anything out, I can't, you know, someone in church, I don't think I can, work, I don't think I can be friends with that person, I can't get along with them. Hey, maybe you can impart a blessing to them. Maybe you can be a friend to them. And then once you take that first step, they can bless you in return, and that friendship can develop. And quite often, it's, it's a very judgmental approach, right? Again, it, it's, it's, it's really f being full of pride, because maybe you might think, hey, I'm, a, I'm of a spiritual level, you know, higher than others, and, you know, if I talk to that person, they're just going to pull me down spiritually. You know, they're not, they're not adding anything to my spiritual life. Um, you know, very judgmental. Or, you know, I, I don't like the way that person lives. I don't like the way that person dresses. I don't like the, the way that person... Look, you need to impart your wisdom and your love toward that person, okay? Because if you're just thinking about who I can be friends with and who's going to benefit me, that's very selfish. All you want to do at that point is take, take, take and not give, give, give to other people, okay? Now, of course, the Bible says in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's a greater blessing to give than to receive. So when you're looking at making friends, don't consider just what can I get out of that person, but what can I give to that person? God will bless you greater if you have that mindset, first and foremost, okay? Now I'll give you one quick example. I remember in one of my former churches, I won't name the church or the person, but um, Christina, my wife, was trying to make friends with a lady, and then for several weeks, for some reason, that, that lady stopped talking to her, you know, just ignored her, wouldn't even greet her, and Christina would come to me and say, you know, what, what have I done wrong? Like, have I done something to, you know, upset her? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And then eventually she said, look, I'm just going to ask. I'm just going to talk to him. I'm going to say, well, you know, what's happened? Why are, you, why are you ignoring me? Like, you know, I, I thought we were, we were becoming friends. So Christina asked the question, you know, what's, what's happening? And she said, oh. And, and by the way, at this point in time, we were pretty new at the church and we didn't have the convictions of attending every church service. You know, we weren't going, you know, eventually we were, eventually we were attending all the church services. At that point we weren't. We were going Sunday morning, Sunday night, but not the midweek service. And, um, and she said, oh, it's just, I've stopped, decided to stop talking to you because you're not attending all the services. <laughs> you're not attending all the church services, so, you know, I don't want, you know, I'm only looking for people that will uplift me and, and I'm looking for, you know, very spiritual people. I mean, that's very selfish, right? That's very selfish. I mean, look, some people just don't have the same convictions that you do at that point in time. Maybe no one's even, and I don't think any, anyone even came to us and said, hey, you should be in church all three services. We were just going to two. No one really questioned it. We never felt bad about it. You know, we just, you know. And uh, she's like, no, you know. And here's the funny thing. Like, you know, my wife and I, we had a few kids at that stage. So, was, you know, you, people with kids, you know how hard it is to get to church and, and get everyone organized and all that. And then eventually when she got married and had kids, you know what, she's not at every church. In fact, she's at less church services than what we were at at that time, right? But just showing you how, you know, people avoid making friends because they're too judgmental, too selfish, too, hey, what can I get rather than what can I give? So these are some reasons why people avoid making friends. Now, the reason why I think a lot of friendships suffer, and I'll be just honest with you, I think it's the public school system. The public school system, right? A lot of people take their kids and put them in... And look, I'm not actually against giving your children over to someone to educate them, 
just to let you know, right? We've given them over to a piano teacher to teach them piano, swimming lessons. You know, I'm not against that concept as long as the parents are still involved and, and taking um, accountability of the, of the education of their kids. But a lot of people put their kids in public school, all right? And then they struggle, you know, especially if they want to homeschool. They struggle once they pull the kid out of public school because the child's, you know, being brought up in, the, in this uh, public school system and the way friends are understood in that system. Let me give you some examples. So some errors with friendships based on the school system. Number one, people think, children think, kids think that I can only make friends with people of my age or my grade. Okay, now I've been there. You know, I was in school and I felt that way. When I was in my grade in my year, I thought, you know, I can only make friends with the people in my year. All right, I can't make friends with the ones lower than me or the ones above me. That, that's, you know, especially if you make friends with the kids in lower grades, that's, that's a bit dorky. That's a bit nerdy. Like, you know, there's something wrong with you if you're making friends with, with people of a younger age. But that's generally what happens, right? And people think, hey, when they're in, when they're in public school, that they're, um, you know, they're, they're being socialized. But really, all they're learning is how to be friends with that same age group. You know, when kids are homeschooled, they learn to be friends with all the children. They learn to be friends with the parents. They learn to be friends with neighbor kids if they play with them, things like that. Um, and so that's one big issue, right? Now, let me, th let me ask you this question. When we think about friendship in the Bible, and you guys can answer, who do we normally think about when we talk about friendship? What relationship do we normally think of? Our best friend. Our best friend. But just some characters from the Bible when we talk about friendship. Do you want to give it a go, guys? Uh, Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David, yeah. Number one, right? As soon as we think about friendships in the Bible, David and Jonathan, best friends. And sometimes people read that and they think, you know, Jonathan and David were these teenage kids, you know, they grew up together and they were buddy buddy. But let me show you something. Uh, you won't realize, you probably don't realize just how different in age they were. Uh, so, first of all, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13. 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. I'll give you a bit of a Bible study here. 1 Samuel 13. Now, another question, anyone can answer it. Does anyone know how long King Saul reigned for? How long was Saul the king of Israel? How long did he reign for? Anybody want to give it a shot? 40. 40 years, yeah. So King Saul reigned for 40 years. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, let's read 1 Samuel 13, verse 1 and 2. It says, Saul reigned one year, so now he's reigning one year at this point, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Mishmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. So this is now the second year of, Saul, uh, not Solomon, of Saul's reign, right? And who was one of the captains of the army here? Jonathan, his eldest son. Did you see that? So Jonathan, now anybody know how old you have to be to join the army in Israel? At least 20. You have to be at least 20. So in the second year of Saul's reign, Jonathan was a, at a minimum 20 years old, right? He's probably older than that. But, you know, at a minimum he was 20 years old. So if Saul reigned for 40 years, how old was um, Jonathan when, when Saul died? So add 40, well, well it's two years that he's reigned, right? There's 38 years left. So it's 38 years plus minimum of 20 years. So when Saul died, Jonathan, his eldest son, was at least 58 years old. Do you guys get that? 20 plus 38. At least 58 years old. Now, does anyone know how old um, David was when he reigned? When he began to reign? When David first became king, how old was, was David? Does anyone remember? He was 30 years old. David was 30 years old. Let me just read it to you. 2 Samuel 5, 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. So he also reigned 40 years. So he's 30 years old after the death of Saul, right? So how old was Jonathan at a minimum at that point? 58. David was 30. 28 years at least difference in what we consider the best friends in the Bible, right? So doesn't that blow the whole idea that oh, I can only make friends with my age group or my grade? You know, we ought to be people that can make friends with all age groups, right? All peoples, no matter how different it is. You know, he was old enough to be his father, 
Jonathan, uh, Jonathan was old enough to be David's father. And yet, they were best friends. They got along just fine. And so, you know, it's, it's a big misconception that we learn in, in public school, hey, that we've got to make friends just with our age group or there's something wrong with us. Another thing that uh, school does wrong, it, it bases friendship on popularity. Normally, the popular kids make the most friends, right? That's what we think of. We need to make friends with the popular kids. But you know what? Christians will never be popular in the world. <laughs> just get used to it. You'll never be popular in the world. J Jesus says in the same, in John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hate of you. So if you think you're going to be popular as a, as a Christian, just forget it. If you're going to try to make friends with the popular Christians, it's because they're of the world. <laughs> if you think as a Christian that's very popular, I mean, I, I, I went to youth group, you know, some churches have youth group in this, and, and again, the popular kids, were they the most Christian kids? Were, the, were they the most biblical-minded kids? No, they were the worldly kids. They were the ones going and, and knowing all the movies and maybe smoking the cig cigarettes, you know, in, in, you know, behind closed doors and whatever. They were the worldly ones. They were the popular ones, even amongst the Christians. They were the popular ones amongst the Christians. But you know what? If you're going to be a God-honoring Christian, forget it. You know, you're not going to be popular, okay? So this idea of making friends with the popular kids or trying to be popular and making friends, that is not a biblical concept. That's a worldly concept. Another, another problem that you do with, that, that public schools create is uh, friendships get based, uh, are based on common interests. Now, there's nothing wrong with common interests. I think it's a good place to start. You know, when you start to make friends and you want to get to know each other, it's good to have those common interests, ask questions. Oh, yeah, I also do that. And, and you, you know, you can build from there. But quite often, and this is what I observe, I don't know, I'm sure you guys observe the same thing, but quite often kids would make friends with the same ones that, that like the same music, for example. Right? The, he the, the kids that liked the heavy metal music, they were all, you know, they were all together. And the kids that liked the hip-hop, you know, they were all together. And the kids that liked, I don't know, the, the, the douche douche stuff, you know, they were all friends together, right? No one admitted to like the, the, the pop music, right? No, no one admitted to liking that. Everyone must have uh, heard it. Um, or maybe the common interest is sports. You know, they like the same sport. You know, they like soccer or they like rugby or they like tennis or what have you. Um, I also, you know, sometimes you'll notice that friends get made by those that want to be more ac academic. You know, often, you know, the term used in my day were nerds. You know, the, the nerdy kids got together. They wanted to be academic. They, they studied together, did their homework during lunch instead of playing and things like that. You know, their common interest was the academics. Uh, uh, now, again, th there's nothing wrong with finding that, that common ground. But when your friendship becomes about your common interest then it doesn't become about the person anymore. It becomes about that interest. It becomes about that hobby. And that's all your friendship is based on. It's not based on you as a person. Let me give you an, al an analogy of this. If someone was able to clone another Kevin, just like me, another Kevin, we've got the exact same interests, don't we? Another Kevin, exactly the same. We're going to have the same interests. We're going to be so alike. And people all often say, ah, I just want to find a friend that I can... Uh, that I can, you know, that have the same interests as me, you know, the same age. But look, if there was another Kevin, it'd be a very boring friendship, right? Because I already know everything that, that Kevin wants, that likes, right? Finding someone just like you is, very, is a very boring experience. What makes friendships exciting is meeting someone that doesn't have the same common interest and then learning about that person, learning about their hobbies, learning about their interests. It opens up your mind to other things than just the things you're interested in. You already know the things you're interested in, <laughs> right? But it, it opens your mind to other things. So don't be in a mindset that I must make friends with just those that are just like me and have the same interests. They say very school-based mentality or friendship. I've also seen friendships based on uh, ethnic uh, identity, you know, an ethnic background. In my school, you know, the South American kids, you know, I'm South American, but there was a group of South Americans. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be part of that. You know, or, you know, sometimes you'll have the international Asian students. You know, they, they may, you know they'll, they'll be friends just with one another. And they don't... They don't you know, make friends with other people. I don't know if you guys have experienced that as well. And I've actually been in a church that was very much like that. Like the church I was at, it was just one ethnicity. Again, I won't name it or, the, you know, just one. And we, we tried our best to be part of it. It was very hard to be friends. Why? Because they break out into their language and we didn't know what was going on. You know, when, when you have people of one ethnic background, they have certain traditions, they have certain ways of doing things, they have a certain culture, and it's hard for you to break through and make, make friends. And we eventually had to leave that church, not because the church was, you know, look, the people were friendly, don't get me wrong, they were friendly, 
but it was very difficult to just be part of the church, and we had to look elsewhere where there was a bit more multicultural, uh, you know. And the Bible says, what did Jesus say about his, the temple, the house, or the, the, we can talk about the, the church being the New Testament house, that my house shall be called, of all nations, the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You know, it's a house for all nations, okay? We shouldn't worry about making a church for one ethnicity and a church of one language. Nothing wrong with having an interpreter. Hey, you know, if you, if you live in an area where there's a lot of, of one ethnic minority and they can only speak one language, nothing wrong with you preaching English and having an interpreter preaching in the other language. That's fine. But hey, keep the church together. Don't break it up because now you're going to hurt the friendships that can develop amongst ethnic uh, variety of people. So these are some things that the school teaches how to make friends. And then people struggle when they get to work because when they go in and get a job, they realize, hey, I'm working with people of all ages, I'm working with people with all backgrounds, all different interests, and they find it hard to adjust from going to school where they just amongst their peers, and now they've got to get into the real world, and now they've got to work with everybody. So let's move on to some biblical principles in making and being a good friend. Uh, Proverbs 18.24, can you turn there? Proverbs 18.24. I think this is, a, this is a very... And look, the Bible has a lot to say about friendship. And I, I, I don't have time to go through everything, but I think this is a really good principle and we can build a lot of, this, uh, a lot of things from this. Proverbs 18, 24. Now, if you're struggling to make friends, this is a really good verse to meditate on. It says, A man that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Just that first bit. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. If you're someone that doesn't have a lot of friends, it's probably because you're not showing yourself friendly. And if you see people that have a lot of friends, it's probably because they're showing themselves very friendly. They're being very kind and very nice and very considerate of other people. So some, some principles of make, being a good friend, making friends and being a good friend. Number one is take the first step. Take the first step. Remember, it's, it's, you're more blessed to give than to receive. Don't wait for that person to make that first step. Don't wait for that person to start the conversation. You go. You go and start that conversation. Oh, I went to church, but they didn't say hello to me. Oh, I went, they, they didn't say bye to me. Hey, you go and say hello. You go and say bye. You know, I mean, people forget that there's, there's, people, there's a lot of people in church. You know, people are packing up and organizing their kids and what have you. People might forget to greet you, might forget to say bye. Don't get offended. Just, just you, take, you, know, you take the initiative. You take that first step and go say hello and say bye. And smile. You know, learn to smile to people because it's, it's, it's the smile that's going to draw them to you, right? If you have a grumpy face and you look frustrated and you look angry, you know what, if, if you're that way, I'm going to think, I don't know if I should approach that person. I mean, they look pretty upset, you know. I might make things worse if I go and talk to them. No, but you know, have a smile. Take that first step. Number two, show an interest in another person. Show interest in another person. Now, you might say to me, but Kevin, I'm not interested in that person. Just force yourself. Force yourself to show some interest. Ask questions, right? The best way to have a conversation is ask questions about... That person knows more about themselves than anything else. So a good place to start is just ask them questions. Hey, you know, what do you do for work? What did you get up to this week? You know, uh, is there anything I can pray for? Are you, are you struggling with anything that you, know, you need prayer for? Ask questions. Learn about that person. Don't worry right now about you trying, you know, you having to get things off your chest. Hey, learn about that person. And you know what? Even if you force yourself to show an interest, I'd say, I promise you this, if you force yourself to show an interest and ask questions, as you start to hear them talk, you are going to become interested. You are going to start caring for that person and loving that person, especially when you hear about their struggles and trials in life. You want to be someone that can help them. Show an interest in them. Ask questions. You know, find common ground. Make them feel comfortable. When you find common ground, that's what helps someone be... You know, we, we do this when we go soul winning. You know, we go soul winning. It doesn't matter, what, like I've said this before in other sermons, it doesn't matter what they say behind... If they know about Christ, they know about the cross, I'll often try to find that common ground with them. Hey, so, oh, so you know about Jesus Christ coming. What, what happened to Christ? Oh, he died on the cross. Those kind of things. You know, that interaction. Oh, that's common ground. Yes, you know, we, we come from... You know, we have different religions. We have different beliefs. I'm bringing you the gospel, and you don't, you don't understand the gospel just yet, but try to find where you can to have that common ground to build that friendship as you preach the gospel to people. Same thing with church. Find common ground with people. You know, try to find something that you can relate to. Um, and then take note of what they have to say. 
Don't just ask questions and forget about it. Take note. Focus on what they're saying. I'll tell you why. Because next time you see them, you can ask them about what you just spoke about last week or whatever. You know, you can ask them, so how'd you go with that? You know, oh, you were struggling at work with that person. You know, have you, have you managed to find a way to, to deal with that person in your workplace? Whatever it is, you know. Bring up that... Because you know what's going to happen? And this has happened to me. When people ask me something and then I forget about it, and then they come, oh, how'd you... I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot I mentioned that to you. And what does that... Oh, you're interested in me. You're inter- you love me. You care about me. You want to know. You're a friend. You know? You've been praying for me. You've been thinking about me. You know, you don't realize the impact you have just by bringing up things that were talked about in the past in their personal life. And... Uh, Next one, use their name. <laughs> use their name. And, you know, when you talk to someone and you use their name, it makes it personal. Right? If you're saying to me, Kevin, I'm gonna, it's going to draw attention to me because you're using my name, right? You know, I was talking to someone, uh, just yesterday, I was talking, well, not, when did we, yeah, yesterday, I was talking to Matt on the way back from, from, the, from the coffee we had, and I mentioned um, Jason's name, and Jason was like, huh? <laughs> you know, you heard his name, right? <laughs> you know, there's a saying that goes, um, you know, take it, yeah. I didn't take it down, but there's a saying that says something like, uh, there's, there's no sweeter word than someone's name. Like, there's, there's no sweeter word to that person than their own name. Something like that. And um, even, even when we do have coffee in the mornings, what's the lady's name? Is it Sue? Jan? Jan. Jen. Jenny. Janet. Doesn't Janet use your name? When you go, right, you go there, and, and I you know, ask for my cappuccino. She goes, oh, Kevin, you know. And she called me Keith the other day, and then she was upset about it, like, oh, but she's trying to use your name, why? You know, she, she's a salesperson, but you feel special, don't you? Hey, you remembered my name, you're using my name, uh, I'm an important customer to you, I'm going to come back, right? I mean, Callum knows this, Callum uses, when I talk to Callum, I realize Callum uses our names a lot, because he comes from a sales background, right? That's something you get taught, you know, because like, you're trying to build rapport with people, you're trying to make things personal, use their name. And, uh, you know, this is a biblical principle, 3 John 14, but I trust I shall short, shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Greet your friends by your name. And guys, what did we read on Wednesday? We read, we read uh, Romans 16, right? What, did Romans 16, what was the first half of Romans 16? I salute this person, that person, name after name after name after name. Why? Because Paul was friendly with them. Paul cared about them. Paul was considerate. He used their name. So use people's names when you talk to them. They like it. Um, next one, be self-sacrificing. Be self-sacrificing to your friends. You might sacrifice your time. You might sacrifice money. You know, someone has a need and you can provide them some uh, monetary assistance. You can assist them with resources that you might have or, you know, your knowledge. You know, you can sacrifice many ways for your, for your, for your friends. What did Jesus say? Greater love hath no man than this, that a, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ was self-sacrificing for his friends. You know, that's a good lesson for us. Find a need. Hey, my friend, what need can I feel? You know, and I'm very thankful when we came to the Sunshine Coast, so many of you were saying, hey, is there anything we can do? Do you need food? Do you need this? Do you need that? Hey, I felt very appreciated. I felt very loved, very touched, you know? And you're you know, you being self-sacrificed, and I really appreciate that. That's being a good friend. Next one is don't be overly negative. Don't be too negative, right? As a friend. Now, there's a time to be negative. There's a time to be depressed and down. And a good friend will hear you out. Hey, but mix it up a bit. <laughs> Talk about positive things as well. If you're constantly negative, if you're constantly depressed, you know, your friend will stick by you for some time, but it's going to come a time where... They're going to be like, hey, you know what? This is really depressing being with you. Like, is there anything that you're thankful for? Is there anything that you're happy about? Is there anything that you're joyful about? Because when, when you're dealing with someone that's constantly negative, you know, constantly you know, uh, being judgmental, constantly complaining, constantly, then you know, it, it puts a strain in that relationship. You know, same as a marriage. You know, if one spouse is always negative to that other spouse, constantly negative, never thankful and appreciative for what the other person does, it's going to have a strain on the marriage, you know? Don't be overly negative. Ephesians 5.20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, we're commanded to give thanks always for all things. 
Now, does that mean we'll never get depressed and never get down and in the dumps? Of course we will. But even then, there's an expectation that as believers, we give thanks for the things that we have. Hey, we ought to appreciate. Hey, we're not like, you know, we don't live in a third world country where we're dying of hunger. We don't have a roof over our heads. You know, real problems. Our problems that we deal with, what, what are they really? You know, if, we, if, if people in these third world countries could swap their problems with ours, they'd do it in a heartbeat, <laughs> right? We get so down and depressed for things and you know what? We're clothed, we've got food, we've got friends, we've got family. You know, no one's life is perfect, but we have things to be thankful for. And God wants us, even when we're down and depressed, to thank God for the things to show our appreciation, right? You know, if a husband's out there working, sweating, you know, sweat of their brow, just working hard for their family, you know, making sure they can make ends meet, that there's food on the table, you know, and the wife's constantly complaining and nagging, that's going to make the husband feel down and like, oh man, I'm trying so hard to, to supply for my family. But I'm constantly, you know, where's the appreciation? Where's the thanks? Same thing with God. Hey, we ought to thank God for all things. And I, I, didn't, say, I didn't say wife to the husband. It can be the other way around as well, right? A wife can be, you know, raising the kids and helping where they can and, and you know, making sure that a meal is being cooked and all this kind of stuff and the husband comes complaining, oh, why isn't that clean and why isn't that done? You know, the reverse can happen as well, not appreciating one another. So don't be overly negative. There's a time to be negative. There's a time to be down. A good friend will stick by you, but if that's all you do, it's going to be a strain on your friendship. And so the reverse of that is be a positive influence. Hebrews 10.24 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. All right, let us consider one another. Let's think about other people, not just yourself, and provoke others unto love. Why? Because we ought to love one another and to good works. You see, that's been positive. That's been a positive influence. Right? When you're down in the dumps and you're negative, it's hard to grow in love. It's hard to do the work. But when you're positive, when you're upbeat, when you're trying to you know, uh, encourage one another, that's when we can do great things for the Lord. So be a positive influence to your friends. <clears throat> so in conclusion, just to wrap this up, if you've heard me preach right now and you're going, yep, I know who you're talking about, Kevin. You know, so-and-so needs to be a better friend, right? Then you're not getting the, you're not getting the sermon, <laughs> if that's what you're thinking. You know, so-and-so needs to be better to me. You know, they need to be a better friend to me. No, you missed the point of the sermon. You need to take this on board. You need to be the better friend, right? I need to be the better friend. You need to be the better friend. You need to make the first step, okay? You need to be stop, you know, you need to stop being so judgmental. You need to be accepting, and have patience, and have love, and provoke your friends to love and to good works. So I thought this message was just good to meditate on. Since we're approaching Christmas, right, we start thinking about the people that we know, the people that we love, maybe even people we've not even spoken to for a long time, and then it comes Christmas and we think, oh, do I write them a card? Do I send them something nice? Do it! Be a good friend. Be a good friend. Let's pray.